This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We're now going to go through and look at impairments. It's a standard that, again, you have seen in F7. It's covered by IS36. So the way in which we'll go through and do it, like we've seen with the other standards, is we'll just recap the technical aspects in terms of the rules, and then we'll apply that uh, within an exam style question. Okay. Uh, so again, there's nothing new to go through there and learn. Uh, so remember, when you're looking at an impairment, uh, the first thing that we need to identify there are the indicators of an impairment. So we're looking there at either external or internal indicators. Again, that's something that you would likely have to spot there within an exam question. The common one that you tend to go through there and see is that maybe a business is making operating losses that could be a sign there of an impairment or if you like a change in the way the asset is being used so again what you could have there is maybe a discontinuing or restructuring of an operation which changes the use of the asset the other ones that you've got there again you have seen them previously within f7 so I don't think I need to spend all that much time talking about them. They should, if you like, make sense from what you've seen previously. But thinking about it from a P2 perspective and things that we've regularly seen there are discontinued or restructuring of your operations, operating losses that, that lead to an impairment review. OK, uh, once you've got the indicators, that's when you then go through and perform the impairment review itself, isn't it? Uh, so remember the key bit there is that we look at the carrying value. If it is greater than the recoverable amount, then it is impaired, isn't it? Okay, uh, And you impair it from its carrying value down to its recoverable amount. We've already seen this, haven't we, with regards to a subsidiary within our group as part of the syllabus, whereby when we looked at the carrying value, we identified the subsidiary as a cash generating unit. And then we compared that to the recoverable amount of that cash generating unit being the subsidiary. Okay, I think we also looked at it as well with regards to an associate, whereby the carrying value was there, wasn't it, as the investment in associate. And we compared that to the recoverable amount of our share of the associate, wasn't it? Okay. Uh, again, what you've got there, uh, the recoverable amount is thinking about that the best use of the asset. So we could potentially go through there and compare the fair value less cost to sell uh, if we were to deciding to sell it or the value in use. And uh, the value in use is, is the discounted future cash flows, isn't it? Discounting them back at an appropriate discount rate uh, over a period not exceeding, is it the five years? Uh, you could go through there and be asked to go through and calculate those figures. Alternatively, you could be asked to discuss and explain and apply them within a given scenario. Again, uh, directors do not want to impair assets. So there is potential, isn't there, for them to try and potentially be unethical by turning around and saying, well, look, uh, we can't calculate this figure or we don't have the information to be able to calculate this figure. Therefore, we cannot do an impairment review uh, and therefore that there is no impairment. Uh, whatever business it is, whether you're looking at a subsidiary over which you have control over, even if you have an associate over which you have influence over, you will be able to get access to that data, wouldn't we? So we'll be able to work out the fair value. We'll be able to estimate cost to sell. We'll be able to work out the value in use by getting the data for the cash flows and choosing an appropriate discount rate. Once we've gone through and thought about the carrying value, the recoverable amount, and see whether or not it is impaired. The issue then is about how we go through and process the impairment, isn't it? Again, we've already seen it in an earlier example with regards to PPE, in that any reduction is taken through profit or loss immediately, isn't it? Unless, okay, it is a revalued asset, and then it goes to the revaluation surplus first. So one of the examples, I think it was the second example that we looked at with regards to revaluation, wasn't it? We'd revalued it upwards and then subsequently there was an impairment that utilised all of the reserves for your evaluation. And then we needed to put some more impairment through profit or loss, wasn't it? OK, then what we've got with regards to your cash generating units, 
uh, you've got their specific asset first. So whatever specific asset is damaged, write that off. Then goodwill, isn't it? Uh, and then if there is any impairment left, go through there and allocate it to the remaining assets on a pro rata basis. Again, that has been seen in the past numerically within question number one, whereby you had to work out the impairment in the subsidiary and allocate it to specific assets, then goodwill, and then pro rata the remaining assets. Okay, I think in the questions that we've done so far that you saw when we looked at impairment of subsidiaries, there were no specific assets to be impaired. It just all went to goodwill. Okay, but just be aware, specific assets first, then goodwill, and then any remaining assets on a pro rata basis. Okay, excellent. So, so that's the background. That's the theory. That, that's stuff that, that you've seen previously. Uh, shall we go through there and have a play around uh, with the example? Okay. Uh, so it says that show how the impairment loss in Sharon is allocated amongst the assets. So it says Peter owned 100% of the equity share capital of Sharon, a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, the assets, the reporting date of Sharon were as follows. So you've got goodwill, buildings, plants and equipment, other intangibles, receivables and cash. And you can see there that they have a value, is it, of 17,000 or 17 million as we're working in thousands, aren't we? Uh, it says on the reporting date, a fire within one of Sharon's buildings led to an impairment review being carried out. So an internal factor. And the recoverable amount of the business was deemed to be $9.8 million. So we need to go through there and impair that down. Is it to the $9.8 million, isn't it? Okay. Uh, it says the fire destroyed some plant and equipment with a carrying value of $1.2 million. And there was no option but to scrap it. So $1.2 million of our plant and equipment has gone. Uh, the other intangibles consist of a license to operate Sharon's plant and equipment. Uh, following the scrapping of some of the plant and equipment, a competitor offered to purchase the patent. Is it there for $1.5 million? So that's telling us the value of the patent. And also we have the, the value that's been destroyed of the plant and equipment. So we're told the value of the patent, it's 1.5. The intangibles are there, is it at 2 million, isn't it? Okay. Uh, the receivable and cash are both stated at their realizable value and do not require impairment. Okay. So what we need to go through and do that, if I can remove that to give myself a bit of space. Uh, we need to go through there, don't we? And impair the asset down to, is it the 9,800? Uh, 17,000 less 9,800. Does that go through there and give me 7,200, isn't it? What I need to go through and do there is I need to allocate that impairment across those assets. Well, the receivables and cash, we were told they do not require any impairment. So we're happy there. Uh, but what we've got, first of all, is we need to allocate it to specific assets. So specific assets that are going to be, is it uh, the plant and equipment that was destroyed? So some plant and equipment, was it of 1,200? Was destroyed. So that gives me there, is it the 4 million? Okay, we assume that everything else there is in a purely functioning working capacity okay uh, so that means i've taken is it 2.6 million out of the 7.2 uh, the remainder then goes next to goodwill so is that 2.4 million okay oh careful before i do that there was a specific impairment wasn't it to do with the intangibles be careful christopher so that's one four hundred ah oh, chris can you just stop that video and play around with it just so that we then just start off with the example again. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it, it just, yeah, I made a slight mistake there, didn't I? Okay, so we can just bring it into the example starting now. So let's go through and have a look at the example. Uh, the example goes through there and wants us to look how we allocate the impairment loss uh, in Sharon uh, amongst the assets. So we need to know what the impairment loss is first to then be able to go through and allocate it. So it says Peter owned 100% of the equity share capital of Sharon. So Sharon is a subsidiary. And if it is a subsidiary, it is then essentially 
a cash generating unit, isn't it? Okay. Uh, it says on the reporting date, a fire led to an impairment review being carried out and the recoverable amount of the business is 9.8 million. So based upon that, the value of the business is 9.8 million. Meaning there that there is an impairment of 7,200 that needs to be allocated. And that's going to be allocated against any specific assets, then any goodwill, and then any remaining assets on a pro rata basis. Uh, it says the fire destroyed some plants and equipment with a carrying value of 1.2 million. So we'll need to remove 1.2 million, won't we, uh, from the value of the plants and equipment. So that's a specific asset that's been impaired. Uh, other intangibles consist of a license to operate the plant and equipment. So given the plant and equipment's been damaged, uh, we see now that somebody has offered to buy it from us for 1.5 million. So that's the value of the intangibles. That looks like it's impaired down from its 2 million value. And the receivable and cash are both stated that they're realizable value and do not require impairment. So that makes things nice and straightforward there, doesn't it? Because the receivables and cash are not impaired. Cash is never impaired. It doesn't happen, does it? Okay. Uh, but the receivables are there. They're realizable value. So they are fine. What we need to do now is we need to impair down those specific assets. So there was two, wasn't there? First of all, it was the plant and equipment. So one, two hundred we need to remove, don't we? To get us down to the four thousand. Okay. Because that was what we scrapped. Uh, likewise as well. Uh, the patent is there, is it at 1.5 million? So 500 is the impairment there. So of the 7200, we've allocated, is it 1700? Uh, so there's plenty there, isn't there, to utilize against the goodwill at 2400. So all of my goodwill has gone. And then what you've got then, so if you like these two here. Where step one, the goodwill is step two. We then allocate the remaining amount, don't we, pro rata? Well, there's no reason really here to pro rata anything. It's just going to go to the value of the buildings. So 7,200 less 500 less 1,200 less 2,400 gives me an impairment of 3,100. Which means there is it that the value of the buildings is 2900, isn't it? Okay, there we go. If there were more other assets to impair, that 3100 would be allocated on a pro rata basis. Okay, uh, however, it's just the building because the goodwill is gone, the plants and equipment and other intangibles have already been impaired, so there's no need to adjust them yet further. So there we have it. Okay, I have allocated that full 7200 to the specific assets in the order determined by IS38. And then these are the figures that would then be consolidated within the group accounts. And this is the impairment that would be shown with in profit or loss. There you have it. Other than that, that's it in terms of your impairments. I'll see you all again within the next session.